Hey, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just a quick shameless library plug before we get started. Um, the Rathbun Free Memorial Library and the East Chatham Free Public Library are uh, once again open to the public. We've actually been open for a little while now, but uh, if anyone still wants curbside service, that is definitely still available. So feel free to visit our website or give us a call if you have any questions. Um, and if you enjoy programs such as this or have any recommendations for programs that you'd like to see, please be sure to give us some feedback either in person or on our Facebook page. Um, and with that shameless library plug out of the way, I'd like to introduce our wonderful guest speaker tonight. Um, Phil is the founder of, uh, the founder and a principal of TO Design Landscape Architects, which specializes in the design of public outdoor spaces. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled and honored to have him as our guest speaker this month. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Phil Barlow. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I'll also say I'm a 25 year resident of East Haddam with my wife, Dawn, uh, my dog, Molly, and our two sons who have since uh, flown the nest. So I've been looking at these uh, pieces of artwork for about 25 years now. So it's a great opportunity uh, to learn a little bit more about them. What we'll be looking at are the Soldiers Memorial, sometimes known as the Civil War Memorial, Nathan Hale bust, General, Sp Gen General Joseph Spencer Memorial, the sculpture Working Together by Heinz Warnicke, and then a few miscellaneous uh, pieces uh, around town, a lot of which are, are a lot of fun. So from the Sphinxes of ancient Egypt to the equestrian uh, statues of Greek and Roman times, to the ever-present obelisks, to the Gateway Arch of St. Louis, to Lincoln Memorial and the larger monuments that we know. Humankind has been memorializing ideas, people, and events. And our town of East Haddam uh, is certainly no exception. Uh, we have several memorials and public art pieces that are uh, certainly of note. And we'll start with the Soldiers Memorial on the Moodus Green something that we all uh, pass, if not daily, uh, certainly very often. So the Soldiers Memorial, and note that it, it actually was not called the Civil War Memorial. That name didn't come till later uh, to name monuments in general uh, to the Civil War, to name them Civil War Memorials. They were generally named Soldiers Memorials, and that, that was a tribute to the people of the community uh, that served in that war. And if you think about it, um, war memorials were not common until the Civil War. Um, up until that, till that time, the Revolutionary War, the French and Indian War, the War of 1812, uh, really had not been memorialized in this way. Uh, we do see some tributes to those wars now, but most of those came after the Civil War. And we'll look at a couple tonight that are uh, from that, from the um, uh, from the Revolutionary War, uh, but again, the Civil War really started the movement to memorialize uh, those who uh, served their communities in the nation. Um, the general thought is that uh, the, the Civil War so traumatized the nation uh, that we needed something like these memorials to to to, to cope with our loss. Um, certainly on a much smaller scale, but you know, not unlike all the hearts we're seeing now, they're so prolific, uh, just the way that people, people to express themselves and, and deal with their angst, if you will. But this monument is, is very typical of Civil War monuments and uh, art pieces of sculpture in general. It's composed of, of three main uh, parts. There's the base, which is the three uh, horizontal pieces of granite. Uh, the pedestal is in two parts, and then the sculpture itself standing on top of that. And for these monuments, uh, certainly it was almost always a Civil War soldier. Uh, that stands on top of these monuments. They almost always look south if they can. Uh, that was a prevailing uh, thought. And if you get closer, uh, you can read the inscription. And the inscription is, in honored memory of the brave defenders of our country in its hour of peril, 1861 to 1865 directed by Charles Miller and his wife, Eliza Wheeler Miller. And looking at the sculpture itself, this would have been carved um, out of a solid piece of granite. 
Um, typically, these weren't done by artists, if you will, but more by artisan artisans, um, and often they were monument uh, monuments, as in um, a grave monument makers. Uh, this one was made by uh, a company in Hartford uh, that is, is still in business and still making um, uh, burial memorials. Around the base of the sculpture, it um, around the base is the name of the four major battles that presumably East Haddam residents uh, participated in, Gettysburg, Antietam, Apotomus, and Petersburg. And all but Gettysburg have the names of the uh, soldiers, and uh, that certainly there were men at that time uh, that did participate uh, in those battles. Uh, Gettysburg, the name Gettysburg has the memorial plaque uh, below it. So that's kind of interesting to me that uh, uh, evidently, the names of those that participated at Gettysburg aren't shown like the others because uh, there wasn't room. But uh, very interesting to me to look at some of these names, certainly not names we see today. Uh, Elephalant, Corden, Phineas, uh, names of the time uh, and certainly mark the time of the late 1800s. Eliza Wheeler left money in her will, in her will uh, for a war monument, a civil war monument to be, to be established. She had been part of a uh, woman's support movement in town that um, had been organized like many, many across the country that generally supplied um, materials, clothing, food to soldiers, kind of a benefit, uh, beneficial organization. Uh, that were, very, again, very prevalent in the Civil War and, and certainly very effective. But what's, what's fascinating is that she not only gave the money for the monument, but she stipulated that it look exactly like the one in the Wilbraham Mass. And the if you look to the image to the right, that is actually the one in Wilbraham Mass. Uh, and so a quick glance, they're identical, but if you look little closer, you can see that they do have some differences, uh, but it's essentially the same monument. Uh, what her connection was to Wilbraham Mass, I don't know, uh, but she did, again, stipulate that she was giving money to erect a very specific uh, monument. The memorial was dedicated on October 24th, 1900. Now, reading about the monument, I read that the one in Wilbraham uh, had cannonballs on all four corners. And you can see the one cannonball on the right corner there that still survives. Now, further reading, um, I discovered that the one in Moodus, presumably the one in Moodus, also had these cannonballs. But the story goes that, quote, schoolboys dislodged them and rolled them down the road into the stream. Uh, so that's a great story, but lo and behold, when I climbed to the top midpoint of that monument and looked, there had been cannonballs there. You can see where they've been displaced. So I thought that was a fascinating piece of history to come upon. The company that carved the stone was a Stephen Maslin company in Hartford. Uh, they're now known as Zito Monuments, uh, certainly a still well-established and prolific uh, company made of Vermont bar granite, B-A-R-R-E. And the bar, the bar Vermont granite is the granite that we see uh, everywhere pretty much. It's our curves, it's buildings, it's our monuments, but a very common uh, piece, uh, type, of mar uh, type of granite. I talked about how prolific these monuments were uh, across the country and certainly in Connecticut. Connecticut has 169 towns uh, and 163 of those have a Civil War monument of some type or another. Many towns have two or three. Um, some town cities will have a monument, a general monument to the war, and then specific neighborhoods will have uh, memorials to uh, uh, inhabitants of that neighborhood that fought in the war. And typically they are a soldier on a pedestal, this is one down in Norwich, um, all very, very common in styling. And again, they, they, were, they were pretty much mass produced. 
Um, and so they're very readily, readily available and not a high price. Also on the Muda screen are several other uh, war memorials. This one in particular is striking. This is called the Roll of Honor and it memorializes uh, world, world War veterans uh, from the community who fought in that war. Um, and notice it doesn't say World War I. Um, and as you can imagine, after the First World War, um, people couldn't imagine another one. So you'll see memorials of that war, uh, generally memorials to the World War. Uh, but this is a very beautiful plaque. Uh, it's set within a granite slab. Uh, probably wasn't designed by an artist um, of sorts, but more by a craftsman. These tablet makers, these bronze foundries would have people on staff who could uh, design and lay out uh, these plaques that would be available to communities. Uh, this one memorializes, talks about Army, Navy, and YMCA veterans, which was interesting. I think there's one or two YMCA uh, members at the bottom. Uh, this is a newer monument uh, that is honors all veterans um, of all wars uh, from the community. I believe it was a Eagle Scout project, if I'm not mistaken. Michael, do you know that? Is that true? That is true. I just don't know what Eagle Scout. Uh, right. Yes. And I went by this morning and wrote down his name, but neglected to record it. <laughs> so if you have a chance, stop by. It certainly is a great effort and, and another great uh, Eagle Scout project for our community. In the front of the green is a, a newer sign, um, basically a sign board. Uh, that memorial all four specifically. And that's the inset photo that you see. Now, moving on to the East Haddam Green in the village, uh, another monument piece of artwork that we all drive by um, almost every day, if not every day. Uh, we pass it without thinking about it, if you're like me. Uh, but it is a very beautiful and a very well-designed and executed uh, memorial uh, to Nathan Hale. Um, so as you can see, it's a bust of, of Nathan Hale and then set on a very, again, very beautiful uh, and elegant uh, base. Typically a monument of this type, the artwork would be by a, a sculptor and then he would work with an architect to design the base and the different pieces of the base. Uh, here it's the oct oct octagonal uh, slab at the bottom. Uh, the multifaceted pedestal that rises up and then climaxes in the, the bust of Nathan Hale. As we know, Nathan Hale taught in East Haddam, uh, 1773 to 1774. Um, he, he wasn't particularly happy. Um, he talks about in letters to his friends about the remote wilderness known as Mutus. Uh, so he was a young man, and I'm sure that um, in the late 1800s, or excuse me, 1700s, uh, Mutus wasn't uh, exactly an exciting place for a young man. Uh, there's records of his friends writing back to him and basically ridiculing, ridiculing him for, you know, wasting his life away in, in the wilderness of Mutus. Uh, this piece of artwork is by an artist named Enoch Woods, uh, and I, I, I think it's... Um, delightful, if you will, how the name Hale is put at the bottom uh, of the bus. That, that's rather unusual. And just a point of interest, in most pieces of sculpture, somewhere you can find the artist's name, you know, just like a painter signs his paintings, uh, a sculptor typically signs his work. Um, uh, and here you can find it on the, I think it's a northern uh, side of the bust uh, where E. Woods has put his name and the date. So Nathan Hale grew up in Coventry. Uh, he's a Connecticut native, um, born and raised in Connecticut. He went to Yale University and then came to the backwoods of Moodus uh, immediately after graduation, spent that one winter 
uh, went from Moody's to New London, where he taught for another year, and then joined the army in 1775. He was known as a great, a great admirer of George Washington, and that seems to be what drove his uh, enlistment into the Revolutionary War. There's no images, certainly, and no paintings of Hale. So what he actually looked like looked looked like is a total conjecture. Conjecture. No one really knows what he would have looked like. So below the pedestal, or on the pedestal midway, is this bronze plaque, uh, another uh, elegant, well-designed uh, piece of artwork. It reads, on this site stood the schoolhouse in which Nathan Hale first taught during the winter of 1773-74, erected by the Nathan Hale Memorial Chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution, East Adam, Connecticut, and dedicated 1904. So the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, funded and uh, arranged for this sculpture to be uh, on our green. It was actually dedicated on September 22nd, 1905, and again, a gift from the American uh, Daughters of the American Revolution. And another fascinating piece of history I found in my research uh, for years and years, and I'm not sure when it ended, but the Daughters of the American Revolution gave a Nathan Hale Award to the, quote, manliest boy in the school system. So I mean, that was quite an honor uh, at one time. Um, Enoch Woods is not well known. He didn't seem, the sculptor, the, the artist of uh, the Nathan Hill bust, uh, didn't seem to be prolific at all. And as a matter of fact, the only known works are three works of his uh, in Connecticut. He executed another, uh, this one, a full length um, uh, sculpt, sculpture of Nathan Hale, which is in front of the Wadsworth Antoneum. And then he also has a piece of artwork um, likeness of Thomas Knowles, who was a Revolutionary War uh, soldier uh, in front of the state capitol or on the state capitol grounds. And these monuments join many, many others across the United States. Uh, as we know, the nation is captivated by the story of Nathan Hale. There are memorials and sculptures of him from uh, Chicago to Coventry, Connecticut, to Yale University. And uh, once you start looking, it's kind of fun to see these uh, really uh, prolific everywhere. So our next stop is Nathan Hale Park, um, where the Nathan Hale Schoolhouse stands. But on this piece of property, we have the Major Joseph Spencer Memorial. So Joseph Spencer was a uh, Revolutionary War general. He grew up in Billington, uh, lived his life in Connecticut, and is, is buried in, in Connecticut. He comes from an illustrious family. His grandfather was one of the first settlers of Haddam in 1662. Uh, Major General Spencer first gained claim in the French and Indian War where he was known as a brave and capable soldier. Uh, he rapidly rose through the ranks and he then led the militia uh, to Concord, Massachusetts after Concord and Lexington uh, battle uh, to join the Revolutionary War. Uh, the Connecticut militia, militia was immediately accepted into the uh, US military and Spencer led that effort. Spencer had a very strong sense of honor, um, evidently. He, early into his military career uh, in the Revolutionary War, he was passed over for promotion in favor of another uh, Connecticut general who was raised to the rank of Major General. That was Major General Worcester. Um, Spencer was so outraged that he resigned uh, from the Army, from his commission. And to add insult to injury, in what was known as a grave breach of military, eti military etiquette, uh, he failed to personally notify General Washington. Uh, so this was something that just wasn't done. You could certainly resign, but you'd do it in a, in a way that was accepted and in a way that was uh, 
uh, military way. Um, and he didn't, he simply walked, walked off the job. But in the testament to his abilities, General Washington uh, did accept him back when he, I guess, cooled down a little bit and he was then promoted to Major General. This is from the dedication of that memorial, uh, 1904, I believe. You can see a big crowd uh, assembled. Um, it was described as a huge gala with food, drink, uh, and festivities. Major General Spencer grew up in the Millington area. This is a uh, sign post on the Millington Green that talks about his history in that area. Evidently, he had a family farm, family store, uh, and grew up in the area. So the memorial itself is, to me, kind of awkward. Um, doesn't have a lot of artistic sense, I don't think anyway. It, it almost seems like it's an assemblage of, of different parts. Proportions are off. Um, there's no real center of attention, but it very well may have been just a kit of parts, if you will, that somebody you know, bought these different pieces. Uh, maybe they had a schedule that it might look like, but they assembled it uh, on site. Uh, with the exception of the bar relief panel of Major Spencer, which is shown to the right. Uh, that is a, um, a work of art uh, that somebody, some artisan had to, had to make, um, and that's inserted into the lower panel. Uh, as you can see, there's an eagle at the top. That might have been, again, an off-the-shelf item, something that could have been ordered from a foundry and, and not a specific piece um, for this, not a unique piece for this memorial. Spencer did meet with further controversy further on in the war. He was ordered to launch an attack in Rhode Island, and he refused. Uh, he refused uh, to execute that order. Um, it was said that um, he just felt like they didn't have a chance. His men would have been massacred, and there was no, uh, there was no, 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 there was no need to execute that attack. Um, you don't do that in the military. There was an inquiry. Uh, he was censored uh, by Congress. Um, being a proud man that he was, he demanded a inquiry, um, didn't accept the censor. During the inquiry, he was cleared of any wrongdoing. Uh, it was found that um, it would have been a, a disaster if he had have executed the attack. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Spencer, at that uh, time, he did resign and not return to the military. After the war, he became a Connecticut politician. He served in the Continental Congress, and he later served as a senator uh, from Connecticut. And he died at his home in Millington. He was originally buried in Millington, uh, but in the late uh, mid 1900s, he, both he and his second wife uh, were exhumed uh, from the Millington Cemetery and moved to a uh, spot just below his memorial on the Nathan Hale Green or Nathan Hale Park. The memorial itself came about uh, as a result of the efforts of another uh, esteemed East Haddam resident, uh, Senator Morgan Buckley. Uh, if you know some East Haddam history, you know Buckley was a Hartford mayor, uh, born and raised in East Haddam, became a senator uh, of great renown. He gave the land uh, for the park as well as $5,000 to uh, erect a memorial to Spencer. And then one more memorial of sort on Nathan Hill Park. Uh, this is the, a descendant of the Charter Oak tree in Hartford. And uh, we know that story of uh, that's where the charter for Connecticut was hidden when it was threatened to be taken back by the King of England. Uh, that tree has proliferated across Connecticut through its acorns and scions, uh, as well as lots of furniture and artifacts from the original. But it's said that this one was planted in 1902 uh, from an acorn from the uh, original Charter Oak or one of his descendants.
So we'll move next to Old Town Hall, the one of my favorite pieces of sculpture. Uh, this is Working Together by Heinz Warnicke. And I took this shot just to show the context, uh, looking from the cemetery uh, to Town Hall, Old Town Hall, you can see the Working Together sculpture uh, right in front. Um, we'll see some detail of it in a minute. It's, it's not a big piece of artwork, and I've always wished maybe it could somehow be displayed a little bit more prominently. It, it kind of gets lost in the lawn out there, uh, but it is a major piece of artwork uh, by a major uh, 20th century artist. So this is the piece, uh, again, called Working Together. It shows uh, four men moving a boulder, and I guess the uh, uh, the message we get from this is that by working together, um, four naked men can move a boulder that one man perhaps could not. So uh, people often find it uh, incredulous uh, that there's uh, four naked men in a sculpture in front of Old Town Hall. Uh, it is a little unusual, uh, and of course there is a story to that. Um, Heinz Warnicke, the sculpture, sculptor, uh, was a German immigrant, we'll talk more about him in a minute, had a farm in uh, East Haddam, but is said to be a um, often practicing nudist. Uh, they had, he and his wife had friends who were devout uh, nudists, and it's said that when they would have them visit, uh, their, uh, their farm would become a sort of nudist colony, if you will. So a little side, uh, side venture there. But this piece of artwork was, it was cast from another piece. It was cast from a stone sculptor, sculptor, a sculpture that Heinz Warnicke had carved um, at the tricentennial celebration of East Haddam. Um, it was arranged that this would be cast from the original stone sculpture. Uh, the Warnicke family uh, agreed to that and, and donated um, the casting. Uh, and it was placed in front of the old town hall, uh, given to the town in 1985. Again, in honor of the 300 year anniversary. Uh, this is Heinz Warnicke. He was a German immigrant who found himself in East, <clears throat> excuse me, found himself in East Haddam in 1940 uh, after living in Paris for uh, a few years. Again, like many artists of that period did, he did a sojourn in Paris. But he ended up in East Haddam uh, because he said he had friends in Essex and while visiting them, uh, fell in love with East Haddam, East Haddam as many of us had, uh, have, and ended up moving here where he would spend his summers um, at what he called the mowing. Uh, property. This is on Wickham Road. Um, I guess Joe Clark lives here now. Many of you may know him. Um, but that was the homestead of um, Heinz and Jesse Warnicke uh, when they spent time in East Haddam. Uh, it said that uh, Warnicke loved his property in East Haddam. He was a, a gentleman farmer, if you will. Uh, he did work the property and farm the property. He generally divided his time between New York and East Haddam. Um, again, he loved his time in East Haddam, um, working on the property, uh, so much so that evidently it became uh, a bone of contention between he and his wife. Uh, his wife is quoted as saying that she felt like his work, quote, on the farm took way too much time away from his artwork where he should have been spending his time. Warnicke was a uh, direct carver, so he would stone. He would cast stone directly from a block of stone, um, much like this. One of his most famous works, the Nittany Lion, of Penn State University. So, if we have any Penn State graduates out there, you'll certainly recognize this. It's become the symbol uh, on all of the uh, Penn State swag, uh, the Nittany Lion, uh, which was done by Heinz Warnicke. Another piece by Heinz, uh, this is at the Philadelphia Zoo. This was carved from one huge piece of granite. And uh, hopefully you can see it's a mother elephant which her, with her sow in front. Uh, an entire piece was one piece of granite. It's said to be the largest monolithic sculpture uh, in the United States. 
as a uh, sculptor of animals and people and a, and a realist, if you will, uh, Warnicke was fighting, fighting the times and the styles of the times. In the 1940s and 50s, uh, sculpture and artwork was becoming uh, more abstract, abstract expressionist, uh, by the, like these sculptures of Henry Moore. So, um, you know, Warnicke was kind of an outlier and still doing direct carving and very realistic uh, sculptures. Uh, he does have a piece in Lyme. This is Lyme's uh, World War Memorial. It's said that it's hard to find. It's buried, not buried, but kind of uh, in amongst some vegetation, I think, on the grounds of the town hall. I've never seen it, but I do want to get down there and, and try and find it. But I have read it. It's, it's a little hard to find. So other pieces by Warnicke, um, Philadelphia. Um, in Philadelphia, the one on the left is the immigrant, and this was especially noteworthy for Warnicke as he himself was an immigrant from Germany. And, and on the right, a piece of artwork at the National Cathedral called the Prodigal Son uh, highlights that story. And this was said to be one of Warnicke's uh, favorite pieces of art and one of the ones that he enjoyed uh, executing the most. He also carved the, um, the entrance to the National, National Cathedral, the South Titanium, uh, and that is the artwork uh, above the doorway. A very elaborate uh, piece of art, and again, quite an honor to be in the National Cathedral. That speaks to Warnicke's renown uh, and his reputation. And you may know right here in East Haddam at the Historical Society, we have his original mold for that piece. Uh, this is in the edition, which was built specifically for Warnicke's uh, artwork. And this cast in particular uh, is huge. It's you know, maybe 20 feet tall by 20 feet wide and quite a spectacular piece of artwork if you get a chance to see it. And it's a great display on Warnicke's life. Uh, there's lots of his tools, uh, a lot of history about his life and other things. And his last piece is actually the marker at his grave, at he and Jesse's grave, who were buried in the uh, congressional, uh, Congregational Cemetery across the street from Old Town Hall. And it, uh, I think it must be by, by coincidence, but it does directly line up, this memorial directly lines up with his sculpture sculpture working together. Uh, on the left is the piece in context. It's, it's not big, it's probably 12 by 18 inches, but it is highly detailed. And if you look to the right, you can see that it's, it's Jesse and Hines uh, planting a tree and there below it are their names and their initials uh, intertwined. So it's a quite lovely piece. And if you're trying to find it again, just line yourself up with the Working Together Monument, uh, and you should be able to find it about midway back in the cemetery. So moving into more modern times, uh, many of you may have seen this piece. This is on Route 82, just below Boardman Road. Um, I thought this uh, building was a barn, but my wife tells me it used to be um, medical offices and is now apartments. But this is a piece of uh, wall sculpture, wall art, if you will, by an artist by the name of Richard Newton, uh, who lives down in Lyme. Uh, Newton made his, uh, had a career as an illustrator, uh, a highly regarded illustrator. Um, and he turned to sculpture in his, um, I think second or third year, you might say. This is one of his magazine covers. He was a prolific, um, designer of magazine, uh, art, Newsweek, all the, major, uh, all the major magazines of his time he participated in. But then he turned to romance novels. And so he's the one that's responsible for many of the romance cover novel, romance novel covers <laughs> that we see so prolific. And then his third career is as a sculptor. So for modern art and really any type of, uh, of sculpture, the first step in making one of these is a maquette, uh, which is basically a miniature piece uh, of art, a, a miniature 
uh, sized uh, execution of, of the final work. And here the artist works out the details and the proportions and so on and so forth, and then takes it to uh, the bigger scale, and sometimes two or three times, uh, two, or two or three levels until they make it to the final, final size piece of artwork. Uh, but Richard Newton's other work can be seen at Studio 80 down in Old Lyme. Um, haven't been there yet, but I'm told it's an amazing outdoor sculpture garden that's open to the public. Another piece of wall art is at St. Bridget's uh, Church in Buddhas. Uh, you can see this above the doorway, uh, tubular steel. Uh, this too is probably not a unique piece of art. Um, uh, artwork for churches, temples, so on and so forth, um, often can be uh, basically, again, off the shelf, can be ordered from a catalog, uh, many, many different types of, um, of pieces. Um, but I, could, I couldn't find any history on this one, but I, I suspect that, that uh, that's how it got to be uh, here. Doesn't take away from its beauty or its elegance, uh, certainly. And then iPark, we're all familiar with. Uh, they have a continuing rotation of outdoor sculpture. Uh, often, many of it can be seen from the road, you know, like these pieces. But a great, uh, a great place to visit to see outdoor art and take a walk uh, along their trails. And I think certainly um, the cemetery memorials qualify as art. Uh, uh, again, maybe not by an artist per se, but certainly by an artisan. I think this is a very charming piece, uh, George Comer's uh, memorial in the uh, Smith Road Cemetery. Uh, and so this piece in front, uh, if you know Comer, you know he was a mariner, uh, a sailor of the South Seas and, a, and, a, and an explorer of his times. Uh, his grave, this is the memorial stone, his gravestone in back simply says, George Comer, Master Mariner. I think chainsaw art certainly qualifies as public art as well, and we have a lot of that in East Haddam. Uh, both of these pieces are on Smith Road. The left one, um, very simple, but um, very effective piece but then pieces can be very, very detailed, such as this one on the right, which is, a, which is of an American Eagle, uh, very detailed. Chainsaw art uh, became a thing in the 1950s and it's become even, it's been popularized since then. There's competitions for chainsaw art. Uh, the making of these sometimes become a performance art type of event where the uh, chainsaw artists will produce the artwork in front of a crowd. And then we have many pieces of vernacular art around town, the fun pieces uh, like this fish um, on Boardman Road, uh, very whimsical, uh, the cow in front of the shag bark with the uh, attendant sheep, just kind of adds to our daily lives as we pass these by and appreciate them and maybe get a smile or, or a chuckle out of it. Vintage signs have also become a type of artwork, and you know we see these around East Haddam displayed on old barns and pieces of property. Um, this one from Goodyear Tires, and the symbol in the middle is of the winged foot of Mercury. Uh, so I've never known that. You see these things every day and never really think about it, but that came about because the founder of Goodyear Tires had a uh, a figure of Mercury in his vestibule. And the story goes that when they were coming up with the logo, they looked around and they saw this winged foot and they thought that would be perfect uh, for tires. And then last but not least, uh, you know, today we have a proliferation of hearts uh, around town everywhere you look, everywhere from tree stumps to the side of barns to a simple palettes, uh, an expression uh, to the community. Uh, certainly, I think that's public art, the public memorial, uh, and certainly a sign of our times. And I'm, I know I'm happy to see those, and, and I hope they continue. So that's not what I have about public art, sculpture in East Haddam. 
Oh, th thank you so much for that, Phil. That was that was incredible. It's it's really neat to get the the kind of the background and the history of the things we see every day.